So good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, in case you were wondering who the Nancy was, um, <laughs> I'm Nancy Hoffman. I'm the Vice President and Senior Advisor at Jobs for the Future. And I am going, I have the honor, the great honor of introducing our keynote speaker. But I, I must say before I, I, I do that, that I think of myself as one of the handful of grandparents of, of early college. And if you had asked me in 2002 when we were just beginning early college with this crazy idea that the Gates Foundation with Carnegie and Ford had kind of laid on JFF's doorstep that I would be looking at a room of 600 people who are committed to this idea, I would not have, have guessed it could possibly have happened. So it's thrilling to see all of you here. And I hope my grandchildren, who are now four years old, um, I hope that when they are grown up and going to college, they won't have to worry about the gap between high school and post-secondary and that they'll be able to take college courses just as soon as they're ready in a supportive environment. And I hope all of you can tell your grandchildren that story too and say you were all pioneers. So I am really honored to be able to introduce our speaker who is Stan Littow. Stan has been a major innovator and leader in education for a very long time, both from the public sector when he was deputy chancellor in New York City and now for many years at IBM. Um, his formal title is Vice President Corporate Citizenship, Corporate Affairs and President of the IBM Foundation. But underneath that, I think there is no one else in the country who has the kind of uh, commitment that Stan has to speaking both for the business community and to them and for educators and to them about the critical need for business and education to work together. And it's not just theory in Stan's case. I was going to ask you how many people have heard of PTEC, but it looks to me like how many of you have heard of PTEC? Let's just take a look here. So I'm sure you're going to hear more about it from Stan. And I was also going to ask you where was o President Obama last Friday. But uh, Greg gave that away. He was visiting PTEC, which is the Pathways to Technology Early College High School in New York City. So I'm sure Stan will, will talk more about that. But I wanted to just make sure that you understand how critical it is, particularly in the current economy that young people are facing, that business take a role in supporting education and in building career pathways. And I think Stan has made an immeasurable contribution to that dialogue and to actual activity to build career pathways because not just of the theory that business and education should wor work together, but because of the huge support both in the real on the ground design work and the national policy implications that have come from the from PTEC. And I'm sure Stan will talk a little bit about the demand for replica uh, replication of PTEC. Um, but I will say that one of the things that's really exciting is to see that New York State, for example, is now funding substantially a replication of 16 new PTECs, all with business partners. So that should take us a long way to building a model that not only connects young people with post-secondary education, but with future careers. So I'm going to just say thank you to Stan for being here today and thank you to his IBM colleagues for making this all possible and joining us. And I will say just to add to the uh, contributions that Stan has made, in the News Observer today is an op-ed piece called Taking Early College Concept a Step Further. It talks about all of you here today and about the, the PTEC model and the president's visit and Somebody smarter than I with Twitter, I hope, will tweet you the link, and you can read this yourself. So with no further ado, thank you so much, Stan, for being here. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to, uh, this is the uh, definition of preaching to the choir, I guess. Uh, because we're going to talk a little bit about where we are right now in terms of school to career and um, what we can expect. Uh, and I think we can't put the onus on any one element in society 
to solve this problem that we've got. This is not a problem that the federal government is gonna solve or state governments are gonna solve or school districts or community colleges or businesses. This is a problem that requires a shared solution. So we're not gonna get anywhere unless we're working together. So let me tell you a little bit about, um, thank you very much for the very kind introduction, uh, Nancy, but I come at this from a variety of different perspectives. I worked in the public sector way back when in the mayor's office in New York City, was deputy chancellor of schools, ran a not-for-profit you know, organization in New York, have been at the IBM company. So I've had an opportunity to look at this a set of problems around education and economic development from a variety of different perspectives. At IBM, which uh, I, I hope I don't have to explain to you what, an IB, what the IBM company is. Big company, last year we celebrated our 100th anniversary. Uh, we've done a lot of work uh, in education over the years and a lot of work in public-private partnerships that have touched on public policy problems and on education problems. As I was going through the archives of IBM uh, over the 100-year period, uh, to celebrate 100 years of IBM. There's a lot of information about when IBM created the background uh, information systems to run Social Security. That was a public-private partnership. The federal government passed a piece of legislation, Social Security. They had no expertise to be able to set up the information and management systems to be able to do that on such a wide scale, and the IBM company did that. And in the 1960s, uh, the President of the United States talked about putting a man on the moon, uh, and that was also a, a, a real leap of faith. And companies like IBM got involved in loaning engineers and scientists to be able to move, improve the space program. Many of you who are in higher education, maybe you know a lot about the discipline computer science. Computer science was created at the IBM company, and that's a lot of information in the archives about, about that. So, Education, public-private partnership, not something new, but needed now more than ever before. So uh, let me talk a little bit about this idea of grade 9 through 14. And again, uh, a lot of people in the room know a lot of bit about, about this. But, you know, we've got a problem, and that is the workforce has changed markedly. The kinds of skills that people need to be able to hold middle-class jobs have changed and the kind of opportunity has changed. And education, and I speak to this as somebody who worked in education, is not known for rapidly changing to be able to accommodate the changes that have taken place in society. So we know that we need to develop more students with these skills. We know that the systems that have been in place were designed a long time ago, and we know that we need to change. And, um, in the Pathways to Prosperity report that Harvard uh, outlined, it laid out a whole range of data points that were important for people to understand about why this change can't operate on a slow, slow pace. Because the data tells us that there are going to be about 14 million new jobs over the next 10 years that will require uh, middle skills, the kinds of skills that people will get out of early college and, and P-TECH kinds of models. But unless we do something to bring this activity up to scale, we're not going to be able to provide that opportunity for the large number of students who want it and need it. The second thing that we know is that community college graduation rates are far too low. I mean, that's for a lot of reasons. Some of them are economic reasons but a lot of them have to do with college preparedness. Uh, we are in a company at IBM that does a lot of work on data analytics. We picked one community college. We looked at the entering freshman class, and if a student with a high school diploma enrolled at this community college and was taking two remedial courses, one of them was math, 99% of those students dropped out before the end of the first semester. So, a high school diploma wasn't college preparation. So we need to do more about that. We also know that the high school diploma is nowhere near as valuable as it once was. Remember, it wasn't until the end of the Second World War that we made high school mandatory 
in the United States. Before then, it was optional. Lots of people could leave school with an eighth grade education and earn a middle class wage. We made that change as a country, and we said we need to get more students' high school diplomas. And that was as important as anything as making the U.S. competitive in the second half of the 20th century. But what do we know now? The high school diploma has not got the value that it had in 1950. So things have changed. A high school diploma going into the workforce does not mean a middle class wage, ever. So we know that we need to think differently about getting more students prepared for post-secondary education. And not just post-secondary education, but the skills and the academic background to be able to have a solid, important, worthwhile career. The job growth. We know that there are jobs. You know, when we talk about the job crisis, is it an unemployment crisis? Is it a skills crisis? It's unemployment and it's connected to skills. Because if you talk to employers, and I do all the time, there are jobs for people who have the right skills. For people who don't have the right skills, there are not those jobs. Last month in New York City, if you went on the websites of companies that were hiring, there were about 300,000 job vacancies just in New York City alone. So, but to be able to hold those jobs, you needed the kinds of skills to be able to hold those jobs. Employers are finding a hard time getting the people who have the right skills. And that will only get worse, not a whole lot better. That puts a great burden on us for change. So looking at that problem, we stepped forward to build on the early college model and create pathways uh, 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 to education, early college, high school, PTEC. And as you heard, the President visited PTEC on Friday. He talked about it in the State of the Union address. There are things about the PTEC model that are particularly important. Um, first of all, it is a collaboration and partnership between the IBM company, the New York City Department of Education, and the City University of New York and City Tech. We work on this plan and model together. Nobody delivered it. We were not the corporate partner that somebody found at the end of the day to try to find some mentors or some you know, work experience or internships. It was an integrated planning process to create this seamless six-year program. And you know, certain elements, when you build anything that is a model, you need to start thinking about, can this model scale while you're putting it together not at the end of the process. And that is the problem that a lot of people have had thinking about bringing initiatives to scale and making them sustainable. People think in education or any other enterprise, you build a model, you make it successful, and of course, if it's successful, everybody will want to do more of it. Everybody will want to replicate it. But if in the design it's not scalable, it won't be scalable. So if the design was that you spent a whole lot more money than any other school, forget about it because people will dismiss it and say we don't have the money. Or if you changed all the rules and regulations on one exception basis and you couldn't do that for all schools, forget that because people will, will put all the rules aside for one example, but they won't put it all, uh, aside if you're talking about a scalable and sustainable solution. So everything about the PTEC model was designed to be replicable in other geographies. Um, it had a clear basis on the early college model, but the connection to the world of work and career was embedded in everything that went on in the PTEC program. So every student has a mentor from IBM. There is a thoughtful way of providing mentoring. It's not just, here's your mentor, go find a way to improve things working together, create a platform, an electronic platform, train the mentors, have content 
that mentors and mentees can work on together, stress the importance of academic connection to the workplace skills, embed the workplace skills into the coursework, create a special workplace learning curriculum, have structured workplace visits, have people from uh, the world of work in the school doing joint projects, teaming projects, build paid internships into the program, make it so that students see the connection between school and career. And as Nancy indicated earlier, give them an opportunity to take college courses when they're ready to take them so that they can accumulate college credits in a seamless fashion linking high school to college. Look at the relationship between the high school courses and the AAS degree in computer science or applied sciences. And give an opportunity for each student to progress at their own pace. So we opened in September of 2011 in Brooklyn, New York, in a neighborhood that the president visited. It's Crown Heights. It's not a, a pristine, brand new, uh, middle class neighborhood. It's a working class neighborhood across the street from one of the most challenged public housing projects in the city. It's not a charter school. There's no special admissions uh, to get into it. It's an open enrollment uh, program. Students choose and select it, but they're selected randomly. They're students who want to be there, but they don't have the academic preparation necessarily when they began their program. But moving on this path to an AAS degree, every student in the building knows a couple of things. Number one, they know that they're on a clear pathway to get an AAS degree. They're in college. They're in the ninth grade, but they're in college. Number two, they know that if they complete that six-year program with that AAS degree, they're first in line for jobs at IBM. So they are IBM employees in training. They all have mentors. They all have an opportunity to progress academically and to acquire the workplace skills. Now those workplace skills were drawn from about nine different job categories that we hire for at IBM. And we mapped those workplace skills directly into the curriculum. So that things like presentation skills or problem solving or teaming skills are part of the coursework at PTAC. It is project-based learning. It is connected to the world of work. And as a consequence, the connection to work in college, the students wind up progressing at a more rapid rate. We now have 335 students there, 101 in grade 11, 123 in grade 10, 111 in the new grade 9 that just started, and high attendance, high achievement, in spite of the fact that there's no admissions criteria uh, to get in. And we've got a great principal. We all selected him together, Rashid Davis. Great leader for the school, but he's not the only great principal. There are lots of others. And he's not, he doesn't have a faculty that has the only great teachers in the United States. We can make great teachers if we make great schools. But this is not the only example. It can be replicated, and it was. When the mayor of Chicago was elected, Rahm Emanuel, he came to New York City. He met with Michael Bloomberg, the mayor of New York. They met together. He said, is there an idea that I need to know about that I could focus my attention on? And the mayor said, PTAC. Mayor Emanuel hit the street. He picked up his cell phone. He called our CEO and said, I want five, I want five PTECs, and I'll give you a year. I want them in, I want them in a year. That's the mayor of Chicago. Uh, so we began scrambling, IBM, working with Chicago City College, Chicago Public Schools, the mayor's office in Chicago. Could we fulfill this goal of replicating PTEC in Chicago? There are now four grade 9 to 14 schools in Chicago with other partners. Sarah Good STEM Academy, named after African-American woman who had the first patent of an African-American woman in the United States on the south side of Chicago, working with Chicago Public Schools, Richard Daly College. We opened this school in 2012, and it has 
463 students, 221 in grade 10, 242 in grade 9. Every single student at Sarah Good has an IBM mentor. The same model, they're following the same playbook. Principal, teachers, business link, skills mapping, mentoring, workplace visits, highly structured and in a not easy to work in neighborhood in Chicago. Sarah Good is doing very well. High attendance, high achievement, uh, better than the average school, doing very, very well and demonstrating that with the same network of support following the same playbook that is replicable and it can work. And it is working. And now the question is, can it work in other places? Can you expand this model elsewhere? Can you attract many more employers to play the role that IBM is playing? Can you get the playbook to be put into place successfully in a variety of other districts? Does it depend on the City University of New York, great higher education institution? Does it depend on one or two mayors who are national leaders like Mayor Bloomberg and Mayor Emanuel? Does it depend on a 100-year-old, very large company, IBM, that has a lot of experience in education? We don't think so. The governor of New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo, announced in his State of the State address that he wanted to have p all over the state of New York. He put a relatively modest amount of money in the state budget, ran a competition, and 16 p schools will open in the state of New York next September. And if you look at the districts, they're not all urban. They're urban, they're suburban, they're rural. The North Country of New York State does not look like New York City. It does not look like Westchester. It doesn't look like Long Island. Buffalo, Syracuse, Rochester, Newburgh, New York, it is going to serve all of the different communities. And when the opportunity was laid out, many different companies stepped up to the plate to sign the same MOU that we developed for New York or for Chicago, which is a mentor for every student, first in line for jobs when you complete, workplace learning curriculum, paid internships, every single company that was part of a P-TECH planning grant verified that they would step up to the plate on those kinds of commitments. Monday, we will meet with all 16 schools, all 16 employers, the community colleges in the State University of New York system and CUNY, and we will together talk about how we can support this initiative as it goes to scale, which is what's critically important with any initiative. Now, if we look at what New York State is doing, is that unique any more than what happened in New York City or what happened in Chicago? No. New York State has some of the same kinds of challenges and problems that every state in the union has. And it has resources. It has employers. It has great higher education institutions. It has uh, dedicated and interested uh, educators. So it has all of the key ingredients that are present in a variety of other states. And this is something that can be achieved elsewhere. Why not? It doesn't require, um, what are the barriers that stand in the way of making this happen? The biggest barrier is inertia. You know, it's, we've always done it uh, the same way. You know, when, when we started working with the New York City Public Schools about, about PTEC, and I looked at the CTE programs, some of them are great in New York City, but most of them were the same programs that were there when I left the schools in 1993. And most of those programs in 1993 were the same as those programs in 1973. So, you know, if we're going to move this thing uh, up a notch, we have to take a look at all the things that we've always been doing and say, now is the time to change. Now, CTE or vocational education or whatever we want to call it, you know, can form the basis for this big change. Now let's look at, we've got 27 schools since September 2011 between New York State, New York City, a replication plan in Idaho. The current uh, favorite to become the next mayor of New York City 
ran on a platform of 14 more P-TECH schools in New York City. Go on his website, and you can, and you can read about his pledge. 14 more uh, P-TECHs. And governors around the country, especially because the President of the United States came to P-TECH on Friday, and that was a truly thrilling experience for me, but particularly thrilling for the students at P-TECH and the teachers at P-TECH and the principal at P-TECH. We walked out while the president was, was on his way to the school, and we walked out onto the street on Albany Avenue in Brooklyn, and the street was lined with neighborhood residents who were against the barricades waiting for the president of the United States to show up. Uh, and the students from P-TECH, all of whom children of color, walked out on the street, and the people on the barricades said, P-TECH kids, Obama kids, we're so proud of you. And these kids, like it was like they raised themselves off the street. They were so proud to get that kind of support from the neighborhood and from the community. And these are students, many of whom are going to complete this six-year program in four and a half years or five years. Some of them are accumulating so many college credits, they will have completed a year of college by the time they finish the 11th grade. One of those students took college calculus and got an A. Uh, they're doing so well academically because they're getting the support to do so well. There's a picture. The president went into the math class. I love the math teacher uh, at uh, P-TECH. She teaches algebra and geometry through project-based learning opportunities where she challenges the students in the class to work in teams of four and five develop business plans for, to go in competition with Apple to sell your own iPad and figure out how to do the business plan and the PowerPoint presentation and learn the math skills, but also write your business plan. And if you look around the room in the math class, you'll see high quality writing, high quality math uh, uh, being applied to a particular kind of problem. All of the various skills that you would want meshed together in the courses and classes that students are taking at P-TECH. So now the question is, is this something that's going to happen on the south side of Chicago, in Crown Heights in Brooklyn, in 16 other schools in New York State, or 27 other schools in New York State and New York City and Idaho, or is this a reform whose time has come in terms of the United States? Is it that kind of transformative moment, like when at the end of the Second World War we decided that we were going to have in America K through 12, not K through 8? Is this an opportunity for people to reinvent high school? Don't look at this as its vocational education for some kids, a separate track for kids who can't make it academically. Is this an opportunity for us to take the best ideas that we've got, whether it's early college, career and technical education, internships, the apprenticeship model from other geographies around the world, is it our opportunity in the United States to be able to take a look at P-TECH and this model as an opportunity to direct our resources and direct our energy to a strategy that could be successful for all students, not some, not some, not just a charter school for some kids, not just an innovation whose time has come but will pass. Is this an opportunity to think about a different way of thinking about high schools and implementing them? Because I believe, having worked in the public sector, having worked in the voluntary sector, Having worked in a school system, I believe that we have the skills to be able to do this. And from the private sector standpoint, I think people have the motivation to do it because it's in their self-interest to do it. Because if we don't raise the skill levels for our company and our clients and our business partners, they won't be successful and we won't be successful. So what are we doing and what can we do to make this happen? Number one, 
we're taking all of the experience about P-TECH in Chicago, in New York City, around New York State, and we're turning it into an electronic playbook that will be available to anyone and everyone for free. So if you're interested in moving in this direction, you happen to be a governor or a governor's staff, a mayor, a mayor's staff, education leaders, and you're looking for the how-to, let's make it real easy for people to get the how-to. Let's also make it easy for them to gain access to the people who have done it, whether it's the teachers or the principal or the business leaders or the people from higher education. Let's put it on a portal in one place where they can use it, work with it, and have the social and collaborative tools to be able to really embed it in how they do what they do and do it in a more effective way going forward. That's one thing that we can do. We can also help, we in the business community, can help energize our partners, other businesses, to recognize that this is something that they need to do not 10 years from now, not 10 months from now, but now, now, and get them excited about this opportunity. Not in one state, not in one city, but in every state and in every city. Second, we can energize not you know, our best wishes for what could happen at a federal government, but we can better use the assets that we've got, like the Perkins Act, which could be reauthorized uh, with some interest from people in Congress, to be able to take that resource and just say it's not out under formula to all the states, but it's linked to labor market information, where the jobs are. Number two, it's linked to businesses being directly engaged in developing these programs. It's connected directly to higher ed. We create a clear pathway to higher education, and we could use those resources in a much more effective way than we use it now. And we can come up with accountability measures that aren't just did you spend the money, but did you spend the money in an effective way, and did young people get jobs, and what kind of jobs did they get, and use that resource under Perkins as a way to fuel this chain. Second, we have a piece of federal legislation that goes back to the 60s. It's called Federal College Work Study, right? And we give students an opportunity to work to earn tuition. So why should they only work in the library and the cafeteria to earn their tuition? Why can't their work experience be connected to their potential career? Why couldn't employers be collaborators and partners to create not just an opportunity to earn tuition, but an opportunity to learn uh, the work skills that you need to move on once you get your academic credentials. These two programs, Perkins and Federal College Work Study, collectively represent a couple of billion dollars, which could be used in a much more effective way, much more effective way, to be able to support the kind of reforms that we're doing through early college and we are doing through PTEC. Those are changes that don't require a huge heavy lift out of the U.S. Congress or, or other uh, sources outside of our galaxy. These are things that we could do. We have the ability to do them now. So I am optimistic that the model of PTEC built on the success of early college, built on the interest and the energy of the private sector, the public sector, education leaders in K-12 and in higher education, I think we have the ability to make this a scalable and sustainable initiative that will, in effect, reinvent high school and be as significant in the 21st century as things like making high school mandatory or, a, or a, U, uh, a GI Bill of Rights was in the 20th century. I think we could do this. And I don't see the big barriers, not that there aren't barriers. Any reform has barriers. But it's not, you know, for educators, and I, I, I lived in that community for a long time, when people said there's a school that's great over here, why don't you learn that model? There was always, well, they're on a hill, we're in a valley, we could never do that, they're up on a hill. Or that's a K to six school, we're a K to five school, you know, don't tell me about that. 
or a million different reasons why this is not a lesson that we could replicate. P-TECH is a replicable model. Sarah Good in Chicago is a replicable model. And I really do believe that this is an idea and a, uh, a strategy whose time has come, and I think that we can absolutely do it. So the next step for all of us in the room, myself included, is to stop wondering why this can't happen and get behind making it happen. And we are committed to doing that. We at IBM are. We're committed to getting other companies uh, involved and engaged to do it. And I know, and sort of looking out at this room, and I started off with preaching to the choir, is we can sing this song together. We can make this happen together. And I think the time is now. So thank you very much. And uh, I believe we've got a few minutes for questions. Three minutes. We have question one, one, and I have to have a very fast answer. Okay, first of all, we built, you know, the question was about how do we get people to, to step forward to do the mentoring? What, how do we step for, get businesses to step forward to do the mentoring? One of the things that we knew at IBM, when we uh, set up the opportunity for uh, IBM employees to do the mentoring at Sarah Good, we signed up 500 mentors at Sarah Good in four days. Uh, we signed up all of our mentors at P-TECH in Brooklyn in about a week's time. Uh, and to make it easier for private sector uh, employers uh, to do mentoring, we have an electronic platform that has all the training uh, so you don't have to spend all of your mentoring time at the school. There's a lot of things that you can do electronically. It's built into the program design. So I think we can help other companies by giving them some additional uh, help to make the burden of mentoring less onerous on the business. But I think we're finding that a lot of the employers want to do it. We have uh, at IBM 440,000 employees. 220,000 of them do community service. Over the last 10 years, they've done 16 million hours worth of community service. And they want to participate in mentoring opportunities. And to help other companies do that, give them access to the electronic platform. If they want to learn about the skills mapping, we give them access to that work. If they want to find out about the internships, we give them the information that we've prepared on that. If they're interested in workplace visits, we give them the information on that. So we provide the technical assistance so that to the employers and to the educators and to anyone else who's involved, we use the intellectual assets that we built and we provide them to others to make the next step easier for them. So is every employer going to sign up for it? No, but we don't have to have every employer. All we need is critical mass and I believe we will get there. If we look at the businesses who are involved in the state P-TECH replication, they're not all Fortune 500 companies. They're Wegmans, uh, uh, which is a supermarket chain. M&T Bank, which is a small bank, uh, Global Foundries, Regeneron, GE Healthcare. There are a whole range of companies, large and small, who were willing to step up, sign this MOU about mentoring and first in line for jobs, and it wasn't restricted to just companies like IBM. One more, One more question. question. Little question. Question, is your MOU available on your website? It will be. It will be. Thank you. That's it? I just need one more. That's okay. One more. So 
I do have one question. Oh. Um, in rural North Carolina, uh, where we have ec a mass exodus of, of businesses and our largest employer is our school system and the prison, we are looking for virtual partners. Is there any way that we can find a list or a database of companies that are willing to be virtual partners with us as we embark on trying to do something like um, or replicate what's being done in New York and Chicago and other places? Uh, I, I think if you sort of look, I, we can give you the examples of what uh, the people who came forward in New York State, but they represent rural communities as well. The North Country in New York State near the Canadian border uh, doesn't have a lot of large employers. Uh, the networks of companies that have stepped forward are small companies in regional consortia, so I think it is possible to get some. I don't think it's impossible to get people uh, to work on this on an electronic basis, but you know, I can't promise that we could solve every problem and it's going to work every single place, but we've got to start. And I do think that if you look at the geographies around New York State that responded to PTEC's plan in New York State, they're not going to look a whole lot different than rural areas in North Carolina. Okay? So those are the three questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure.